So in the next uh, 27, 26 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about simplifying application integration with event-driven architecture. And what the goal is for you to understand what event-driven architecture is, what events are, and how um, we at Microsoft um, think about events. We're working very tightly with uh, SAP um, and with Asapio. Um, we are working with SAP on integrating um, our platforms tighter. We're also collaborating in the forum of uh, the Cloud Native Foundation on standardization around eventing. Um, and I'm also going to get to that uh, towards the end of the session. What I want to start with is um, a story um, with um, uh, where I'm also engaged in a different capacity because I'm uh, working for Microsoft as the lead architect for messaging services, but I'm also on the digital advisory board of a football club, which is Borussia Mönchengladbach. And uh, there we've done an event-driven integration, and that's very interesting and illustrative for how um, event-driven integration will work. So in the last um, 18 months, we've been doing work to integrate um, Borussia's new ticketing portal um, with the ERP system that Borussia already has in place. And uh, the um, architecture, um, uh, if you're familiar with football, you will know Borussia Mönchengladbach, if you're, certainly if you're in Europe, so I don't have to say much about that anymore. Um, but what we did is we tried to integrate a new ticketing solution, and the ticketing solution is pro being provided by Eventim. And Eventim is a major um, provider of uh, ticketing services, um, and in international cor uh, corresponding um, company might be Ticketmaster. And um, the the exchange of information runs completely in an event driven in event driven way. Whenever in the ERP system we have a new um, uh, account that's being created, and the account might be created in the ERP system directly or might be created inside of the um, um, inside of the shop system, um, we will raise an event, um, customer created. That, that will then be reacted to by doing a transfer into the ticketing system so that the ticketing system has that information. In the ticket portal, you can also show up and you can go and create a new account. And if you do this, then um, this is also synchronized through a customer or or address created event or, or if changes are um, are there. And then they're being um, synchronized also um, into the ERP system. And it all happens under the covers using an event bus um, that is then driven by Azure Functions. Whenever uh, a Clement, ticket is... Um, yes. so sorry, at the moment we, we can't see your slides, only your, your video screen. Are you, oh, interesting. Can you please, please trigger this. I don't this. know how to fix okay. this. Um, did that change? I, I can actually see the slides for you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, that's that's a local problem then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so um, the whenever there are ticket sales, um, those ticket sales are also announced as events um, from the Eventim system, and then we catch those events and then also transfer them into the ERP system. So what happens here is that the portal, the ticket portal, Eventim, has an API which is effectively reactive. They have, they're exposing a series of events um, through um, open API, um, and they're asking you as the, as the partner to implement those APIs. So they have an, effectively an eventing um, system um, that they're, where they have an assumed interface that they're calling. And whenever the state changes inside of their system, whenever an activity happens, they announce this through calling um, of webhooks. And that's effectively the same thing that we're, that I'm going to talk about um, for um, the platform that we have. Um, and uh, it's a practical um, a way of, of implementing or practical example of how those things are being, being implemented. The, um, whenever the ticket has, tickets have been sold, they're also announced to the access control system uh, in the stadium, um, which means that you sell the ticket, we know this, the, the, the accounting information for the ticket is being made known to the ERP. And with that same event, and that is also then being transferred into the access control system so that the ticket is known to the gates um, at the stadium so that you can go and pass. And whenever there is any change to the state of a ticket, tickets are also revoked. Um, then that's also um, uh, communicated as an event 
into the access control system, um, which will then go and revoke the ticket. So all of this integration between Eventim, access, and the ERP system um, is all driven by events, all driven by state changes, without any of those systems being really tailored into each other, but really using the extensibility mechanisms that exist on those to do and drive the integration. We have very similar scenarios um, in uh, many of our use cases, uh, our scenario use cases, and I just picked out a few. Um, Colibri uh, Games is using um, event hubs, so that's a streaming information to go and take click streams, take everything that happens inside the games, um, and moves that through event hubs and then through stream analytics to understand uh, what the game, what the players are doing. The Halo game, that's another, that's another example. Um, has been our um, closest ally for event ups in the early days and still are. And the Halo game is effectively moving everything it has to do with a player career. Um, everything that they do um, moves that as events, like everything that happens in that a game that a player does really, um, and everything that happens on the multiplayer map, all of that information is uh, being transferred into uh, the backend and then evaluated there. And it's it's core for all of our um, cheating and uh, banning uh, functionality on the back on the back end. In retail, um, eventing is very important because there again, all the activities, everything that you do, anytime you navigate, anytime you you look at uh, an item, um, ASOS will run this through a real-time personalization engine, and will then inf and that will then influence what's being served to you up on the next page page load. So all of the activities that you that you have, everything that you click, everything that you look at, has real-time influence on how um, your information is being tailored, and all of that, of course, runs through eventing. In that case, runs through um, again event hubs to um, drive that information. So that's another example of event series. And then we have um, lots of IoT scenarios. I picked out the telematics scenario from Bridgestone, um, which is about tire pressure, tire sensors, tire matics, and uh, allows for uh, management of um, tire quality um, across large um, uh, commercial fleets. So um, in the slides, there are all links to those case studies. So all of those are examples for various forms of eventing. The first thing that we saw, the Borussia case, was um, about discrete events, and the, the other ones were more about event series. So as a, as a mental model of the things that I just showed you, when we start to break this down into, into what the concepts are here, um, there are signals, events, and then there are streams and jobs. Uh, a signal is just broadly speaking the capture of an occurrence, something that happens inside of a so software system or something that happens in uh, the real world. And that can be something like you know, a new address record has been created, an, in an invoice has been written, uh, it can be the temperature reading of a, of a sensor, a statement, a simple statement of fact associated likely with some information about that fact. Then the signal per se occurs somewhere and we will we will want to go and make that known to others. The making known to others is an event. The event packages the signal um, in an appropriate interoperable format and then goes and sends that out via some kind of event bus eventing infrastructure so that someone else can go and pick it up. And typically um, the, the, the party which is sending those events is called the publisher and the party which is interested in those events and wants to get them is a subscriber. An event stream is a chronological sequence of events that relate to the same context, which means if you have a series of events that relate to um, a, um, a certain business activity, um, then it's often useful to have a sequence to, to, to understand what the order of those, of those uh, events were. It's very obvious when you think about uh, information that comes from IoT devices like temperature sensors um, or any kind of, of uh, industrial sensors because there you will want to go and observe trends rather than act exa exactly on a particular um, state change. A job is not an event. A job is a task that needs to be performed by some party and preferably just once 
And the reason why I'm mentioning this here is that events and jobs are often confused and the infrastructures for jobs and events are often confused and uh, they're not the same. So, so events have the sp specific characteristics that they are a statement of fact about something that happened in the past. And a job is something that you want someone, want a particular party to do in the future. Signals can be of, as I said, of very uh, many uh, different kinds. Um, they can be, um, you know, about calendar appointments, reminders. You might have a calendar entry created. The mouse has been moved. The sales lead has been added. The inventory item has been added. Effectively, when you look at your own software systems, when you look at your own solutions that you're building, you have a ton of different state changes. Whenever something, an object is being manipulated, you have an opportunity to go and raise an event about this and then have another system go and act on that. So as you saw with the football case, right, there is a, uh, a fact that the ticket has been, the ticket has been uh, uh, sold has two effects. There is the access control system that is fe uh, fetching it, and there's also the ERP system that is fetching that fact, and both of those parties are doing something else with it. But the raising system, the, 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 the eventive system, did not have to know about any of those two activities um, and didn't have to instruct those two systems to do those things. It simply made that fact known. Um, what events do, as I said, they put events, they put signals into context. And when I said context, that's also what I talked about streams. So you have these various kinds of, of sensors that may be in a building, and then you're structuring effectively your, your events. You're structuring the context from those events. And if you're raising those events, you're raising them inside of that context, you're giving that context with them. Based on that context, based on these paths effectively, you're also able to go and partition um, those spaces which means you can go and handle not only one building, but you can handle thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of buildings with all the sensors in them in infrastructure because you can keep the related events together using you know, their contexts, but you can go and parallelize all of those, the event handling for all of those uh, events um, uh, across many, many different contexts which are un unrelated. And that's the magic that we have in effectively that, the, that we use in these, in these super high scale systems is that we keep those contexts together, but then we allow parallelization across those contexts. Um, there are different kinds of events, as I said, um, that we're handling. One is a, a direct signal that you package into an event is um, immediately actionable. So when you have a sensor that's raising a, a smoke sensor and that's raising a fire alarm, you take action. There is, there is, um, you, you raise this and then you are broadcasting this and then several things happen like the alarm in the floor goes on and you will initiate a call to the fire brigades and you will call, will, you will cause a bunch of activities to happen. It's not predetermined what things you will happen, what things will happen, but you will effectively, you know, signal the fire alarm and then immediately things happen. If you have a temperature sensor and the temperature sensor goes from 20, 0.9 Celsius to 21 Celsius, and that is the threshold from which you will um, go and and start, you know, uh, regulating your your climate control system. You will. It's probably not wise to go and take action on that in, on that particular observation, because for everything that is environmental observations, for everything that's observations of the physical world you will typically not react on um, um, on point readings. Rather, you will, will go and, and project those point readings over the time axis, and then you will calculate out some average or a median or some other some other statistic, uh, statistical formula, and then you will act effectively on the um, um, on that medium. And when you go and uh, um, then um, observe the median and that crosses the threshold that may then again raise an event that may that you may then act on. So you can think of signals that are being created based on observations using some kind of um, a stream analytics uh, tool as derivative functions 
um, as they are as you know of the derivative functions in um, mathematical calculus. Um, and of course, when you are organizing these events in streams, then you can ask, you can answer all kinds of interesting questions if you collect them in a system that's organizing those events um, after arrival. You can tell by the occupancy sensor whether there are currently people in a room. You can tell which room is unoccupied in the building. You can uh, tell what the air quality is on the lab floor because you can go and do sensor fusion of, of a number of uh, environmental sensors and you can calculate this. And then of course, if you are um, finding these derivative signals, right? You have um, there's unexpected occupancy detected in in a unit. Then you may may want to go and uh, alert security. And these are all things you can go and derive from basically just having that basic notion, the basic information about events, systems that talk. Um, and this is very illustrative here with a with a building because that's something that you can all relate to. But generally. When your systems speak, when they talk about their own state changes, you can also start extending them. You can go and build logic that is based on those state changes. The kinds of infrastructures we're, we're um, using um, or we're offering, and not only us, but also the competition, fall into four um, basic categories. There's a discrete event router, um, which is for these immediately actionable events. We have Azure Event Grid. Our competition, AWS, they have Eventbridge, Eventbridge, and then in the Kubernetes world, there's uh, the Knative platform that has Knative eventing. All of those are examples of discrete events routers. What they do is they collect events and then they push those ev events out to, for instance, a webhook, but they can also go and target different um, um, delivery infrastructures um, like queues and also event stream engines. There are events which are independent of each other, like the fire alarm. A queue pops up broker, is also often for used to transport events, but they're typically uh, there for jobs, which means this is how you route um, uh, the instructions for when you want to have a job done and you want to have a job reliably done, then you will use a queue pops up broker. So when someone wants to try to sell you a, um, for instance, the Apache Kafka, we're gonna get there in a moment, the Apache Kafka broker as a queue broker, that's just false because there's different infrastructures for um, for those things. So queues are for jobs and event stream engines and event routers are for events. And that is a very clear and important architectural distinction. An event stream engine will go and take um, a number of related events. So an event stream, as I explained, and will then allow you to go and stream those with very, very high velocity if you want to. Um, uh, uh, Azure Event Hubs, the biggest event hub, single event hub that we uh, operate is uh, transporting over four gigabytes per second um, day to day. Um, and um, we have um, over um, 10 trillion transactions on event hubs every day. Um, an event stream aggregator sits basically between two event stream engines um, or sits at the tail end of an event stream engines and looks at those events and then aggregates them, which means it is the it is the engine which goes and looks at uh, and looks for signals in the data stream. It will go and find the averages. It will go and find the the medians. It will then go and and um, out of the input event stream, it will go and find the respective signals and will go and then uh, again emit them as events and can go and emit them again into an event stream engine or into a queue pops up broker or into a discrete event router. So all those things, those four elements belong together in a event streaming architecture. Um, and to clear up that misconception again, this is mostly about the difference between um, queuing systems and things like Apache Kafka. Event streaming is not modern. Queues are not traditional. They are all patterns of the state-of-the-art messaging infrastructure. So most customers use both. Um, for Azure, um, we, I can say that um, all of the top 500 Azure customers use our messaging infrastructures, and um, most of those customers use multiple of these infrastructure elements together um, because they are um, having different use cases, some of them requiring grid, some of them requiring service bus, 
some of them requiring um, event, uh, event hubs and using all those infrastructures together in a single solution is something that we advise. And uh, so you should not look at whether you are looking, whether you're using one of those infrastructures um, or the other, but you typically you will use them together. And the same is true, the same advice would be given to you by someone who is working for Amazon and AWS. They also have the, the those split for this infrastructures for the exact same reason. So typically um, you have direct interaction between applications that is kind of pre-planned. Um, you're assigning jobs and you want to have those jobs done and you get some feedback that's all direct. That typically is commands and requests and that runs through RPC or runs through queues. And then you have extensibility, which is done through eventing, discrete events, event streams, et cetera. That's how you are building. Think back to my, my, my football example. That's how you build the ticketing portal, the ticketing system, which can then go and raise events about its state changes and then be extended. Um, what's also important to to um, uh, understand is that the event stream engines are be built to be super lean. And lean meaning they are um, um, uh, optimized for low latency. And the reason is that in very many business contexts, real time data is most valuable and most important when it's fresh. And we have scenarios, for instance, in finance where that is enormously extreme, where the value of data is super high. Like in NASDAQ, this is the this is an example from, from the NASDAQ market. Um, you pay um, enormous amounts of mo money for a fresh data market data feed. And the ma market data for algorithmic trading is only really interesting within the first two, three, four seconds. And as soon as the data is 15 minutes old, it's worthless. So the only thing that really makes the data valuable is its freshness. And that's true for very many, many other events that we have in, in, um, in our customer, we see in our customer systems. So low latency is super, super important for many of those scenarios. So that, that's why we are building these, these information infrastructures, for instance, event hubs or, but also event grid, which are, or which are built to, to primarily go and catch rain, as I call it, catch all those events and organize them on disk and then make them as available for consumption as quickly as possible. Um, so you can go and analyze and visualize and react to those things and you can go and create derivatives within a very, very short time. So that's why, for instance, for EventOps Premium in, in, um, in our product, we now have an end-to-end -end latency, which means event in, event out on the other side. Um, from consistency, consistently under 15 milliseconds, um, replicated across three data centers and availability zones, et cetera, um, because that is really important for many of our customers to have the minimal time uh, from ingress to consumption. Um, and then um, we all, but we also think that these event log stores, event hubs um, in particular in our case, are not necessarily the uh, best you know, long-term store because they only index really along the time axis. And so what we then, what you will then do typically is you go and take those event streams and then you store them in a database. And if you want to go and access those streams um, after a while, then you will go and uh, go into that stream store, which might be Cosmos DB or SQL in our case, or might be you know MySQL or DynamoDB on AWS, any of those kinds of databases. And then you will go and and go um, buy your search criteria first, and then you will find effectively those events serialized there um, in an appropriate data structure. So all of all, all in all, um, we are thinking of, of these um, um, uh, integrations that are running through events as a bridge between very many different parts of the system. Um, we have, um, in um, Azure, for instance, we have Azure Logic Apps, which is an integration uh, broker, which has adapters for 400 different um, um, applications, um, SaaS applications and, and platform elements um, in Azure and, and elsewhere, which can go and raise events. We have the IoT platform, um, which can go and catch events. And all of those use standardized events to go and route through the infrastructure 
um, through the event router, through the event streams to make those available for consumption in the various different services that we provide in Azure. What we find is super important in that context is that we make those events available in, sta in a standardized form, which means um, there is a com there's a communication path often uh, from a device, but also from an application that runs through uh, a, a predefined protocol. And then there's multiple other protocols, multiple, uh, multiple other infrastructures in the middle. So you might start with MQTT, then you may, may go and forward the data using, uh, using Kafka, and then you may go and, st and store the information somewhere and then resurrect it and then go and forward using, it, using MQP. What's important is that those events, which are key to driving the logic of your applications, is um, are not that no information of that gets lost. So what we've done in the Cloud Native uh, Foundation, together with the likes of IBM and Google and AWS was there too, um, and uh, and many many other companies, PayPal, is uh, we defined cloud events. And cloud events is a standard for events. It defines what an event is, and um, then then binds those events to serialization formats, MQP, Avro, and JSON but also to transport for uh, protocols, AMQP, HTTP, NATS, Kafka, and QTT, with the goal that if you're sending a cloud event through using any of these encodings and through any of these protocols, then, and you read the, the cloud event back, um, you will have the same event, the same semantics preserved um, through, through all the, the header mappings, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can go and, and, and route that further through some other infra infrastructure. So we have a lossless model here to go and express events. And of course, we have a single model for how events can be handled, for how event, events can be dispatched in a system. The current work that we're doing in cloud events now, after having released cloud events uh, two years ago, is uh, we're working on a schema registry for the payload schemas of events, working on the event catalog for how to um, catalog which events are available and then to make them discoverable, um, to make discoverable the, the endpoints that are raising events, so you can easily, easily, easy, more, more easily subscribe to them. And then a common subscription API to standardize how you can actually ask for events to be delivered for your endpoints. That has That is in various stages of progress. There's specifications for all of those things already. And for the schema registry, for instance, and for the subscription APIs, there are also already products which implement those drafts. So overall, um, from our side, Microsoft, we have a very rich platform, event grid as the discrete event platform, event hubs for streaming, service bus um, for processing jobs, backed by the schema registry that I just mentioned. And then we have another number of other services which are specialized for integration with IoT or with websites, et cetera. And they're all working together um, uh, or integrated together so you can go and, and build your event-driven solutions. The focus of uh, many of the following talks will likely be these discrete events um, for where the focus is on event grid and event grid is also the focus for the integration work that we are doing these days with SAP. Um, so with that, thank you very much for your attention. We have a lot, a lot of things to offer and um, I will be happy to um, answer further questions. If you have them, I'll stick around for a little while to go and, and check the Q&A window.